Good morning, John. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for, for joining us this morning. I'm on the road, so I hope our connection holds. But, um, yeah, I, I know that uh, there have been a lot of calls, I'm sure, throughout the week and so forth yeah. about what's happening in, in schools and uh, especially amid the rising cases. So I did just want to take the opportunity to let people know. I, I don't have the information, but I know you guys do. Uh, it can be found on our DOE Facebook page regarding our uh, our, our call for uh, to parents, uh, our, our Zoom meeting with parents tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning. Uh, to uh, really discuss what we're doing, where we're at, uh, with our parents and our and the general public, and to uh, talk about what we're planning for, and uh, to get further input and concerns and have that conversation directly, you know, with our our parents, uh, you know, anybody else who would like to listen in. So we'll be doing it on Zoom or uh, live live on Facebook. Uh, we'll be taking comments and questions, and uh, public health should also be joining us. Right. Is there anything you'd like to say, though, today to, you know, any parents? Yeah, yeah I mean, there's so much we want to say, and sometimes there's not enough time to, to yeah. do it. But, you know, again, I do want to uh, express uh, the, the very same concerns, uh, the same level of anxiety uh, that I know most other parents uh, are feeling probably at this time, just, you know, listening to the news and watching the overall numbers uh, related to COVID and, and in our schools. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a fellow parent. I have two kids who go to public school as well. And so I'm always monitoring it, whether it's at the central office or even just through the eyes of my own two kids uh, as to what's happening in the schools. And we've been out there visiting schools with public health. And I have to say that I am very, very proud of, of what DOE is doing in terms of our, our safety measures, uh, in terms of addressing these cases, because to date, uh, there doesn't seem to be any evidence of cases that are coming to our schools and spreading. And, and, that, and that's really the, you know, one of the key issues is ensuring that schools don't contribute to the spread uh, of the virus. Now, when it comes to um, dealing with the, the cases that come to school, we know that those cases are coming from, you know, events in the community and households and, and community uh, gatherings and so forth, and we know this because we're in constant uh, touch with pu uh, public health, and when we see these numbers at our schools, especially when there's more than one or two cases, we really ask you know, for, the, for a deep dive into their numbers, what they're seeing, what they're tracing to, so we can verify uh, that these are not due to the transmission between students or from students to employees. So. So we're doing a lot on our on our end, and I'm, I'm I'm just pleased because everywhere we've gone, even though there might be some tweaking uh, and and improvement uh, in some areas, a lot of these these improvements are are really minor, uh, you know, um, based on public health assessment, and we'll work together to make sure we address those challenges. Having said all of that, you know, we did, we had a meeting with our secondary administrators and teachers yesterday. Uh, we've been having meetings all week internally with our nurses, uh, our school principals, our teachers. Uh, but one of the comments was, you know, even if there isn't a spread within the schools, the growing number of cases is causing a lot of disruption and operational challenge uh, for the schools because we've taken on these additional responsibilities and duties. Uh, so when the case, you know, when a case comes in, if it's one case, you've got the school nurse activated, the administrator activated, our social workers activated, on the phone with parents, on the phone with public health, making sure that everybody understands what they need to do to clear, you know, to go quarantine, get tested, get cleared. For the students that are at home, we try to find a way to connect them online so we can continue their learning. For the employees who have to be quarantined, we now have to find people to fill in if they're in the classroom or to assist with supervision. That's just one case. So you can imagine two cases, three cases, five cases at a school, that challenge multiplies even if we're not seeing spread in school. So uh, the, the, the longer uh, that this goes on where the numbers are high in the community and, and, and increasing in the community, you can bet they're gonna increase you know, at the doorsteps of our schools. Um, it is causing a problem and we've got to figure out you know, what our options are if the community 
uh, transmission does not get under control. So we'll be talking about, you know, what we're looking at in terms of numbers, what we're doing to try to get, make sure we get the stories behind these numbers so we can ensure that our kids are safe and protected. Uh, but on the other hand, we have to talk about what our options are in the event that it, it, it makes sense to modify, you know, what we're doing, um, you know, whether it's to go into cohorts, uh, which means dividing our school populations in half or in, into three groups and have them come on alternating days, or, you know, to, to move more students online and shift teachers from the classroom online. Uh, we've got to go through that, that, uh, that process of really nailing down those options and those, those operations. Uh, also talking about, you know, what do we do for food? Uh, how does this affect busing? All these things that need to be factored in. Uh, we're currently, uh, you know, working through to make sure we're prepared for any scenario. So that's what we're going to talk about with our parents. Um, share our thought process, share what we're looking at, and also hear, you know, their concerns and their suggestions as well. John, I know there's a lot of time sensitivity, right, uh, with this meeting. So uh, what, what are you tracking in terms of, you know, uh, from the meeting, gathering all the input to actionable uh, results? Well, I think, it's for, I think for us, we just have to be clear, you know, there are going to be impacts from any decision that we, that we uh, you know, put forward, right? Uh, so there's, you know, so number one is, you know, what, what are the options and what are those impacts? Because, you know, going to cohorts, you know, might help with, you know, lessening the uh, number of, of kids on campus. Um, it means that if, if we are going to, if they're, if they're solely going to be face-to-face on one day and then at home doing work, you know, the next day, it's going to have an impact on the pace of, of teaching and learning, right? So, you know, we have that issue to deal with where we had tried to, to, uh, to do five days of instruction. Uh, whether or not that can continue under a cohorted uh, approach, that's going to be an issue. There are going to be parents who may not be able to find childcare for their for their kids if their kids are not going to be at school every day. That's something we need to kind of hear more about if there's going to be any you know issue and how many parents that you know that will affect. Um, you know, again, looking at other ideas. I mean, there are some people who've approached me and said, "Hey, go cohorts, do it by grade level." And I've had to say, "Well, you know, we can't do it by grade level because even though you lower the number of kids on campus." They're going to be in the same classes with their, you know, at the same time. That means that the classrooms are going to be the same, uh, are going to be at the same uh, number of class students in the classroom, unless you, you start telling teachers that they're not going to just teach third grade. They're also going to have to teach, you know, other grades to help, you know, divide the, the grade levels up. So there are certain things that people are suggesting, some that we'll consider, some that may not, you know, may not work, and we want to explain why. Uh, th- there may be issues, but uh, I think it's really just best for us to get through this conversation, make sure that we've engaged our stakeholders and we've heard from them, and then we can approach next week with that information in hand and, uh, and a better opportunity to make you know good decisions. John, is there going to be any, uh, because we keep getting this uh, truancy uh, issue from uh, parents, is there going to be any decision made that w- could possibly like retroactively forgive absences or, or I, I don't know, just asking. Well, you know, there's, uh, I mean, the, the, there's a law in the books that says, yeah. you know, there, you know, you got to go to school till you're 18. Yeah. And that's, and that's something that we, you know, we, we, we're not going to come out and tell parents, they don't worry about that. Right. I mean, that's, it's the law. And I think we need to say, you know, the, the laws in place, we are asking our teachers to continue to track and, and, and monitor uh, what's going on with the students. So even if it, it sounds like a truancy uh, matter, part of that uh, is to make sure that we are um, ensuring that kids are out, if they're going to be out, that, they're, that we understand what's going on at home. I mean, it's one thing for a parent to say, you know, we're, um, you know, we're doing this because of COVID-19. And it's another situation if, you know, the, the parent says, I don't know, I sent my kid to school. I didn't know that they were absent, mm. you know, three times. So we have to. There's going to be a continued monitoring and and call in contact with parents. And so uh, what we're you know we're hearing this issue. We'll have to sit down and determine how we uh, approach it from the standpoint of communicating and uh, and enforcing the law. But you know again, our priority is to have kids in school. If they're not in school, to make sure they're okay. Yeah. And uh, what this is going to contribute to down the road is looking at what students have lost out on instructional time 
you know, when we're able to come back um, and get them back into school. Right. So, so yeah, it's kind of a tough situation. We're we're in, you know, we're not we're not, we're not telling people to stop and ignore the law. We're saying <laughs> this is what it is, and we need to get that get that information. But it isn't our priority to take people to you know to court. For, uh, to, you know, for this, we understand the situation, and, and I'm sure uh, it varies yeah. case to case. Where you have some parents who are keeping their, you know, kids home out of you know fear of COVID, but then maybe also having that conversation with the teacher, like, "Hey, what what are the assignments?" Or, and I'm sure you have some parents right. who are just like, "You're not going to school. I don't care," which is you know different. Right. Or, or we have you know students, older students who are out, you know, uh, because of COVID nineteen, and then. You know, uh, we see them out, you know, walking out on the streets or, you know, <laughs> out of the store and our SRO officers are, you know, our, our, our school, our school uh, attendance officers are get, getting calls because they're out there, uh, you know, uh, you know, causing a commotion or some type of incident in the community. So, um, you know, there's some of that that's always a normal, you know, uh, responsibility for our attendance officers. So we just want to make sure we track and uh, understand what's going on with these students. Um, John, what would you be your response to people who might question, why are we talking about this now? Uh, why didn't we plan for this sort of a scenario and how to respond to this sort of scenario um, prior to the start of school? No, we, we have we have we have been planning for this, but right now we're wanting to make sure that that you know as every as, in just the same way with in its first couple of weeks, we had all our plans in place. When 28,000 kids come back, they're going to need to make adjustments, right? So, you know, we, we had all the plans in place, but this is the first time that we've been able to implement some of our protocols. And so we know that, you know, there are things that work well and there are things that we've seen uh, need to be adjusted. I mean, we anticipated, for instance, in our planning that there might be people who don't feel comfortable using the buses. Now, whether that's double or triple, you know, the amount of cars that come to your campus, are you know now that we've seen it and we're able to adjust to it those adjustments have taken place so right now we do have a plan we you know to, uh, uh, to go to be able to move into cohorts and to be able to move you know into um you know online um we we anticipated different scenarios one being well maybe we just do this school by school as the number of cases you know uh, show up at a school if there's a if there's a particular school that is just kind of you know the cases are just skyrocketing from the beginning, we need to address that, and that might be a school, you know, uh, one school being, you know, moved to cohorts or being moved online. Uh, now we're talking about the whole school system and what those factors are and making sure everybody's ready. Uh, but we're just, you know, at this point, it's really refining and ensuring that if any questions uh, need to be answered or resolved, that we can that we can uh, do so and provide that guidance while we are making that determination of whether or not to move into that direction so i think we i think uh we're i think we you know we've been in that process of continuing to plan implement adjust uh, you know for such a long time and that's our we're used to it so when we say we're planning it doesn't mean we're taking a blank sheet of paper and trying to figure out how many schools we have and how many kids we have it means that we've got plans that we're now looking at you know do we didn't did we anticipate this in the second third week of school uh, I have to say no, based on the fact that in July we were at our lowest point ever in terms of positivity rate, in terms of new cases. This has tur- this situation has turned around within the course of three weeks. So you know we've had to shift our our um, our um, you know uh, operations to adjust to that, and uh, again we'll continue to improve. So um, what we're doing is just making sure all our administrators are comfortable. Um, that their teachers and, and staff are well informed uh, should that uh, become the scenario that we go into and then the communication with parents as well John so, uh, I know what to do for yeah yeah when you talk, the last question when you're talking about the options right so I know that we're talking about cohorts we're talking about uh, migration to online but can you kind of explain why a uh, hard copy is the least talked about uh, option so so hard copy I mean for number one, uh, it, we, we found out that, that kids were not, uh, I mean, it was not only operationally difficult, you know, in times of, uh, of, of COVID, when we were in a much, uh, in much dire situation, it became very difficult to get, uh, it, you know, assignments out and to collect them uh, back in and to make sure that employees were, 
were uh, able to be to safely do that. So there is an operational logistical issue. We had to reserve Fridays for that so that we could manage the drive through mm. um, and so forth. So there, there are some operational issues. And then academically, the students on hard copy have the hardest, you know, have fared the worst in terms of being able to get, uh, you know, instruction and guidance from teachers. Um, a lot of the students I've talked to, you know, switched from hard copy to either online or face-to-face because they said their parents couldn't help them at home. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we said this is not really uh, working. It doesn't mean that people can't get assignments, you know, to do at home, but it's not going to be an available option for people to do solely hard copy. Um, again, it doesn't mean that hard copy materials cannot be made available to students. There just won't be a dedicated model of learning. Um, it'll, it'll really be dependent on how, you know, the teachers and the, the students kind of work through that um, if that need arises. Well, John, sounds like there's a lot of moving parts to any decision you guys, uh, and that's an understatement, might have to make. So we're going to go ahead and let you go and do that? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, for, thanks, thanks for coming thanks, on, John. John. Absolutely. Thank you thanks so much. There you go. Uh, it's 838. Uh, we're going to put the uh, Zoom link. It's uh, We've actually been posting it on our show, uh, the invite for tomorrow's uh, virtual input session. Again, it is tomorrow, 9 o'clock in the morning. The Zoom invite, invite is up on our stream, and we will also be posting it uh, on our Instagram page. Yes? Yeah. Again, that's tomorrow, 9 a.m. Hey, uh... That was our news uh, brought to you by Pacific Points. Um, we're actually going to take a break and go into the KUA News Zoom room and come back with the Chief of Police, Steve Ignacio. But I did have a couple more birthday shout-outs. Kareen Mendiola, happy birthday 